All right. Well, um, we are going to continue on with our study of how we got here, um, looking at the history of the church and uh, the the history of not just uh, this church, but of like Baptist churches and and uh, going all the way back to the very beginning of this movement that we call Christianity. And so, uh, last time we covered Martin Luther and what caused him to go to the chapel in Wittenberg and nail up his 95 thesis and kind of what resulted after that. And, and as he was uh, challenging indulgences and the practice of selling them uh, because German money was leaving Germany and going to Rome. And he, he wanted to just challenge that practice, not in the sense that he wanted to challenge Catholicism. He just thought it was something that should be discussed. And so he put up his 95 thesis on the Church of Wittenberg so that he uh, could have a discussion with the staff uh, at the university. What ended up happening is there was already a movement because of Wycliffe and others that came before Luther. There was a movement of Reformation, and people were beginning to question these ideas that the Pope had put forward, that the church had put forward. And so uh, many... Many people questioned it when they got their hands on his 95 thesis, it became kind of a, hey, look, there's other people, look at what this guy is saying, this is kind of what we believe, and they started to push him forward as a reformer. And, and as we talked about, he didn't, he didn't want to be a reformer, he was not looking to be a reformer, uh, he just wanted to have a discussion on some things that he thought might be wrong. And what came of that was he gets summoned to appear before the Pope. He gets, he gets caught up in a debate. He, um, he, he makes his famous speech of, uh, here, uh, here I am, a man, here I stand. And so uh, this Reformation begins to take hold uh, over the next few years of Luther's life. And so that's what we talked about last time and uh, what we're going to continue on with in the Reformation. Uh, but before uh, we move on with some of the other people, I want to just uh, just take, take a moment and, and ask this question because of what we're going to talk about next is uh, the five solas. Okay, so... Um, the five solas that we're going to get into come about not because of Luther or any one person. It's, it's actually historians looking back on the events of the Reformation and saying these were the issues, okay? And so because of the practices and the beliefs of the Catholic Church that some deemed uncompliant with Scripture came five foundational truths held by the Protestant reformers. Okay, we call those the five solas. It's, it's Latin. Um, it's the onlys, the five onlys. Okay, so um, can, uh, can anyone tell me what the five solas are? Now, I know I mentioned that last time. You're like, the what? And so... This is something that many of you, or I'm not, I don't know, that some of you may not have even heard of. But it's foundational to the Protestant Reformation. Okay. No. So it's the, it's the, solas means only. So only this, only that. 
Okay? That would be one of them. Oh, you Googled it. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't Google it. You're cheating. I knew. I didn't, I didn't even think of that. When I asked the question, when I put it up there, I didn't even, didn't even occur to me that, well, maybe I should uh, say no Googling before this. Okay. So, yes, uh, we, we're going to cover them. If you have your scriptures, uh, we're going to look at the five solas. So we have the five solas. It's Latin. Uh, uh, solas meaning only. And so the first one that we come across is sola scriptura. Means scripture alone. So like I said, all these are going to be in Latin. So uh, would somebody look up 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17? And while you're doing that, keep in mind that, uh, what, remember what I said is, these are not, you know, Luther didn't say, hey, these are the five solas. Uh, these are, as historians have looked back on this time, they have said, well, these reformers focused on these five things. And, and it becomes foundational for uh, for who we are as Protestants. Okay, so if, if, if you consider yourself a Baptist or you're part of a Baptist church, then uh, you are a Protestant, in which we'll get to that um, and what that means. But uh, so who has 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? All Yes. Okay, so what this means is that Scripture is the final authority for our lives and for the church. So, the Scripture. The Catholic Church believes it's what? Or who? The Pope. Okay, so as the Reformers start to come around and they start to uh, say their things, and they start to challenge papal authority, you have the question, well, if the Pope isn't the final authority, then what or who is? Well, they, that's the question they would ask. The Pope is reading the Scripture and just telling us what it means. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's how they, they, they come to that, but um, which I have a... Um, I have a papist in my family, and so we have great discussions, and so uh, we've been talking a lot lately, um, and, and that's, that's his take, yeah, okay, but so that's, uh, the Pope is the final authority in the Catholic Church, so for the Protestants, they have to answer a question, well, if you're going to reject papal authority, then who has the final authority in all things? We didn't answer that with a who, we answered that with a what. Well, who and what. It's God's Word. It's the Scripture. Scripture has final authority in all things. Okay, so uh, that, that's, that starts, this is kind of the main thing. Uh, that's why I think it's always listed first is sola scriptura, that Scripture is the supreme and final authority in the lives for the church. Okay? The next one is sola gratia, grace alone. So somebody look up Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Now, I'm not giving you an exhaustive, I'm just giving you one verse. There's a whole bunch of others, but I'm just giving you one verse to uh, reference. So who would like to read Ephesians 1, 7? All right, so what this is, salvation is by the grace of God and not by works. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. So how do we gain salvation? By the grace of God. So it's only through the grace that we obtain salvation. I'm not saying that's the, the cause of salvation. It's the, 
How do we obtain? It's only by the grace of God and not by works. So, what does that go against in uh, Catholicism that we've been talking about? Penance. Indulgences, yes. Yes, because in penance, you have to pay something. There's, a, there's something that has to be paid. Okay, and we talked about where, where that came from and how that idea came around um, after, uh, you know, the, the people had been, after martyrdom had become kind of scarce on, after Constantine and how uh, they, they decided, to, well, how do we show that we are true Christians? Well, we, we pay a penance. And they started that practice of giving up or, or surrendering something uh, for the sake of Christ, which then turns into penance. So you go to the priest and you say, hey priest, I, I, I want to be absolved of my sins. And he says, you, uh, you must pray this prayer and then you must do this. Okay, so, but what does Scripture teach? So Scripture is the supreme authority and then Scripture teaches it's by grace. There's no work that you can do to obtain any sort of salvation. But that's not what the, the church had been teaching. Okay, So salvation is by grace alone. And then there's sola fide, faith alone. So you're already in Ephesians. Turn to chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We'd like to read that. All right, so you have been saved by grace through faith, which we've already said. So we are justified by faith and not by works. So justified, uh, easy way to remember that is just as if I'd never sinned. And so we are justified. And so you have this, it's by grace in conjunction with faith. It's by faith alone. There's no works that are involved. Scripture is now, we've looked at that, has taught that twice. Scripture, the supreme authority. It's God's grace that we receive salvation. And it is by our faith and not by works that we are justified, that uh, we are considered righteous. Then we come to solus Christus, which is Christ alone. John 14, 6. Somebody has that one memorized, right? And Jesus answered, For I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Very good. Okay, so uh, that being said, um, once I get you going, you guys know it. Note it? You note it. You note it. <laughs> yeah. We ain't scared. Yeah, got it. That what, uh, what this is, is that um, salvation comes through Jesus, and he is our high priest and mediator, so we do not need an earthly priest. So what does that go in the face of? Goes in the face of the Pope and also priests. Okay, yeah, because you have to go to a priest in order to receive absolution of your sins, okay? Um, you have to do the penance, you have to uh, go through a mediator, but what is Scripture? Remember, Scripture is our supreme authority. What does Scripture teach about that? Salvation comes through Jesus. He is our high priest. No man comes to the Father unless he comes through me, is what Jesus said. And that He is the only way in which we can obtain salvation, that we can be justified, we have to have faith, and it is only through Christ alone. So this brings us to the fifth one. Sola de gloria, 
means God's glory alone. So somebody look up Revelation 4, 11. You iPhone people should be there by now. <laughs> so why does everything exist? Why do we obtain salvation? Why are we justified? Why do we have faith? Why do all of these things happen? For His glory, yes. Because He is the Creator. All of this is for His glory alone. And so it's, it's not for the, the glory of Rome. It's not for the glory of the Catholic Church. It's not for the glory of anything else other than God's glory. Okay? So all of this, our salvation is for His glory alone. It is for uh, him to be glorified, and he is to be, and he is worthy of all that. So, these are the five solas. Uh, these are the foundation of reformation. So, when we when we look back on the reformers, they may not have expressed these things uh, explicitly, uh, although some of them do. Um, but there's no, there, there's no one person, there's no one thing that's like, okay, this is what we're basing this on, is the five solas. Once again, as, they, as historians have looked back, uh, they have said, these are the five points, these are the five issues in which the Reformation is built on. Other issues, they stem from these, but uh, th- these are the five. And so, if we do not hold to these then it's hard for us to say that we are a Protestant church. Okay, that we are part of that, uh, that, that Reformation. Okay, so it's, it, these are the foundations and these establish uh, the churches that we, uh, we call evangelical or that we call like brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, um, you know outside of Catholicism. So, if you, if you look at the start of, say, the, the, the Presbyterians, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to, the start of the Baptists, the start of um, the Episcopalians, those denominations, those groups, the, the Methodists, they come about later, but uh, they, are, they come out of this, okay? And they're, they're established on this, on these five things. And so... Um, it's it's important for us to uh, go back and and look at them and to examine them and say, well, this is is this what we believe? And you know, as as Baptists, we have to say, well, these are the things that we believe. This is what we were built on. Okay, so we're going to move on because of Luther's stance and how influential it was in Germany. Many other countries, kingdoms began to have similar reformations. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight just a few. We're not going to cover this, but, but Tyndale, uh, he was in England. Um, his contribution was a fresh new English translation of the Bible from the Greek and Hebrew. And he was burned at the stake at 1536. And he was a humanist and influenced by Zwingli. We covered the humanist movement and, and humanism and how they, how they, uh, they viewed free will. Uh, is going to be their their big thing, and um, how how others that came out of Catholicism and how uh, they they were challenging what Augustine uh, believed on the nature of sin and original sin. Okay, so the humanists they kind of challenged that. Um, so uh, they're 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 in England. You have Tyndale. 
Um, I'm not going to cover a lot of him because we're going to start to focus and take our slant towards Baptist history. Um, he's going to influence England um, and, uh, and the, the Anglican church that is there um, and, and what's going on in England. But uh, he, he does put forward a, a Bible, an English Bible that will be used Okay, that's that's why he's in here because we're gonna we're gonna look at that uh, when when the King James comes around, uh, his his Bible is going to be referenced in putting the King James together. So um, then we're going to get to uh, John Calvin, and he had a France and Swiss and uh, part of Germany influence in his Reformation, and we're going to get to him, and we're also going to get to. Zwingli, which is, has uh, impact on a Swiss uh, Reformation. Okay, so Luther, he kind of puts these things in motion in 1517, and then these guys start to follow suit with what Luther did and start to reject uh, Catholicism and the Catholic Church. So let's start with uh, Ulrich uh, Zwingli. There's, I, there's so many ways to, to spell his first name. Um, that I just, I picked that one. Um, so if you're going, that's, that's not how I've seen it spelled. It's because that's probably not even the way you say it. Okay, but this is the uh, common Ulrich uh, Zwingli. He lived from 1484 to 1531. And he's going to, uh, uh, he's going to be a little bit different than Luther. So Luther wanted church reformation. He wanted church reform. Zwingli and Calvin, who we're, we're also going to get to Calvin a little bit today, they wanted social reform. Okay, so what, what Luther wanted is he wanted the church to, uh, to kind of change some things and to, that he wanted this reformation of the church and, um, and, and, and he wanted that sort of reform. What Zwingli and Calvin are going to go for is they're going to control land. And the land that they control, you're not going to have freedom of worship under that. You are what they are. Okay, He's going to take control of land. And it's going to be religious land. And so he's going to set up a religious government. Okay, Whereas that's not what uh, Luther is going for. Luther wants the church to reform. Zwingli and Luther are going to uh, want social reform. Now, uh, that's, that's going to make a lot more sense when we, in a long time from now, we're going to cover um, uh, the last hundred years. And when we start to see, when we cover our last hundred years, you're going to start to see some of the same practices that have been going on now were going on then. Okay? And so... Um, it, just what you need to know is that uh, Zwingli and Calvin were not in it to reform church. They're taking control of lands, okay, and, and countries uh, if they can. So Zwingli and Calvin do not believe that there should be any separation between church and state. So Zwingli was concerned with what was contained in the Bible and rejected any religious practice that is not contained in Scripture. Here's, here's like Zwingli's stance. Okay, if Zwingli was to walk in here right now and he would say, you have a cross up there, he would be very upset that there's a cross at the front of the sanctuary. Okay, because it's not in Scripture, you don't do it. Okay? And so his big thing is going to be uh, infant baptism, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Lord's Supper. Those are his, his two big issues. But what he's focused on is if it doesn't say it in Scripture, we don't do it. Whereas uh, Calvin and Luther, they're okay with interpreting, well, yeah, you can do that, it's fine, okay? Okay. So, like, celebration of Christmas, Easter, all of those things, Zwingli would have been like, we don't do it, 
Okay, so you can imagine if you had a Zwinglian church today, probably wouldn't do a whole lot. Um, Because that's that that was kind of his focus. If it's not in Scripture, we don't do it. Okay, so he rejected priestly celibacy because he thought the idea was ridiculous because it wasn't substantiated by the Bible. So priests can't marry under the Catholic Church. And he goes, back that up in Scripture. Um, that was one of his issues uh, that he took, he took up with and, and said, well, we, we can do these things uh, because Scripture says that it's okay or Scripture doesn't say that it's not. And so uh, you can see what's his foundation. Going back to the five solas. Sola Scriptura. Yep. Scripture is the only authority. It's the final authority on all things. Okay, so if it's not in Scripture, we don't do it, it's not done. So his view will set him apart from Luther and Calvin, especially on the premise of Lord's Supper, which we will get to uh, in, in the next few weeks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See where that plays a really strong part. If that's one of your five issues, it is. If that's one of your five issues, if I don't find that in the scripture, then why are we having Sunday school class? Or why are we having this? Or why are we having that? Right. And, and so it's going to drive some people to be much more, I don't want to say labor, conservative or much more restricted. Yeah, so Zwingli was pretty restrictive. Um, but also freeing, because he's not he's not confined by like transubstantiation, priestly duties, these sort of things. Um, when he looks at scripture, he says, "This is what they did. This is what we're doing," and he just that's the way he went with it. Um, it's when we when I say that though, he often would backtrack some because he wants social reform. Okay, so he's, he, he's trying to bring about a society rather than a church. He's using church to influence his society. And so he, he's going to backtrack some, but Zwingli, we'll get to this, he doesn't live long enough. Okay, <laughs> To, to really, to really uh, for us to really, really know what he was all about. Okay, so this is just when we put these bits and pieces together in these things. Um, as far as the inerrancy of Scripture, that's not going to become an issue until the late 1800s or early 1900s. Um, people then, they, they didn't question it. They, they had been tracing this history. They, they knew these things um, that, that we today have kind of, um, you know, kind of not forgot, but just there, there's so much history that's happened since then, since Zwingli was alive. I mean, because remember, he's, he's, his, he's, he's, you know, 1,500 years from Christ. We're 2,000, and now we've got 500 years that he didn't have that we look at more because it seems like it impacts us more today than the first 1,500 years. Okay, so the inerrancy of Scripture, I don't think people really questioned that. Um, it was authority for them. So the sola scriptura is going to become, it's about authority. Does it have, what power does it have? What, you know, what, where does it rank in what gets to dictate to me what I do in practice, okay? And so they're saying it's, it's first. Um, inerrancy doesn't, like I said, doesn't become an issue 
uh, until about 100 years ago that people start to question because of the movement of science. And it doesn't seem that what science says and what the Bible says are compatible. And so errancy becomes an issue uh, then. So, um, so, so his view is going to set him apart from Luther and Calvin, especially on the premise of Lord's Supper and uh, how, how we do practices and if it's not contained in Scripture. So in 1531, Zwingli was about to go to war with the Catholics and sought out Luther for help. Now remember, he's not, he's not raging, he's not bringing about church reform. He's taking land. Okay, so he's creating boundaries, that these are Zwingli's boundaries. And if you don't believe like he does, then you have to get out. Well, the Catholics are, were already there. Okay, they didn't own the land. They, you know, countries kind of did their own thing. It's just the church had a massive control in what the kings and the, the queens and the, you know, the, the royalty was doing uh, because they, you know, they dict the religion of the entire, uh, of Europe is Catholic. He's taking control. He's raising an army. Uh, Calvin's going to do the same thing. Zwingli is going to fight a war in 1531. And so he calls Luther, well, calls, you know, yeah, just, just rings him up um, and says, hey, I'm fighting a war against the Catholics. I need your help. And so Luther agreed to help Zwingli if Zwingli would agree to 14 points of contestation that Luther had with the Catholic Church. So I've got 14 issues. If you agree with them on anything, we're not friends. Okay? So here's my 14 points that you need to agree to if I'm going to send you followers. Now keep in mind, 1517, Luther has... Um, put up his thesis in Wittenberg. Here we are, just, what, four years later, Reformation is taking off. Luther has, huh? 14 years later, sorry, thank you. 14 years later, and Luther now has the ability to raise soldiers. Um, he has people that will fight and die for him. And Zwingli and Calvin, they're raising up people. Uh, Calvin, not so much yet, but uh, Zwingli. Uh, and they're going to war and they're fighting over land and that. So Zwingli agreed to 13 of the 14, but rejected Luther's idea of consubstantiation. The consubstantiation is the elements of the Eucharist are the same essence as the blood and flesh of Jesus Christ. So you have transubstantiation, which means that the elements become the physical embodiment of the, uh, of the blood of Jesus and the flesh of Jesus. Consubstantiation says, well, there's still wine and there's still bread, but the essence of the flesh and of the blood it, they now take on. So if, if, you, if you, you swallow it and you examine the contents of the person's stomach, you're still just going to find wine and bread. But spiritually, those things now have a higher power, a higher purpose, a higher meaning than uh, because they've taken on the essence. So they are the same, just not in the manifestation. Okay, so they're the same as if you were to have the blood of Christ and the flesh of Christ in you. Okay, so that's what Luther believes. He believes in consubstantiation, although he never uses the term. Okay, but that's what he believes. Zwingli does not. Zwingli believes that the elements are a memorial service. It's basically that we have a memory, uh, we remember what Christ did, and that nothing special happens to the elements. They are 
just bread. They are just wine. We apply meaning to them in our hearts, and we worship God through the taking of those elements. That's what Zwingli believes. Luther believes in consubstantiation, and Calvin will also hold to a form of consubstantiation. The two men could not agree, and Luther did not send help. Zwingli went to war, outnumbered, and lost his life on the battlefield. So he doesn't live long enough. Okay? He, um, he, he, he starts a movement, but he loses on the battlefield. But it's going to become very important for our next guy. Um, John Calvin. John Calvin, 1509 to 1564. And uh, so let's, let's look at uh, some of what John Calvin. So Calvin... He grows up Catholic, but it never really takes hold. Okay, he's never satisfied with Catholicism. Um, he's, he's just not that enthused with uh, religion uh, at all, really. His father wanted him to become a priest, but Calvin studied law. So he becomes a lawyer. Um, but... In 1533, Calvin converts to Protestantism um, because of all of this movement that's going on. Okay, so after Luther has done his thing, uh, Luther is becoming uh, popular. He sees this. He becomes enamored with, uh, not enamored. He he become he he really likes what Luther is saying. He likes some of the things that are happening, um, and. He, uh, he's, he says, I, I, he never really liked the Catholicism, but he likes this, this Protestant movement. So, in 1536, he produces the Institutes of the Christian Religion. You guys ever heard of those? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so, this is what's going to set Calvin apart from uh, other reformers. It becomes wildly popular and is still uh, read today because it was a collection of what a Christian should believe. So prior to the Institutes, people like Wycliffe, Zwingli, Luther had all produced pamphlets on what they believed. So here's how this works. So this is what Luther does. This is what Zwingli does. Uh, They write a little pamphlet. Um, Everything has to be handwritten. So they have it copied uh, many, many, many times. And then they distribute them. Okay, so that you can, that's the grassroots of how you cause a reformation. Okay, you gotta gotta influence the people. Um, and you can't do it by the normal ways because everybody goes to church and you can't do it that way because they're not going to teach your stuff in the church, right? Because you're trying to reform the church. And so you get to the people out where they are. And that's what they did. They passed out pamphlets. Uh, they, they just... Um, so this, this might happen to you. You might get a pamphlet and you go, well, wait a second. What came before this one? And so you'd have to hunt it down, or you'd have to find it. Um, and if it came out years before, because you may have questions on something, and they're not answering your questions in these pamphlets, like you might ask the question of transubstantiation versus consubstantiation versus uh, memorial, you know, how do, we, how do we do this Lord's Supper thing? Um, church is saying one thing, the, the priests are saying one thing, uh, but you're like, well, I don't know what Luther believes. Well, didn't you read the pamphlet? No, I didn't read the pamphlet. Why didn't you read the pamphlet? Because I wasn't, I didn't think he had anything going at that point in time. So there comes a lot of confusion uh, with the pamphlet dis- distribution. Calvin does something innovative. 
He writes a book. He puts it all together in one collection. He, 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 he says, this is what a reformation, this is what reformers, this is what we believe. He doesn't take into consideration if it's what Luther believes or what Zwingli believes. This is what Calvin believes. Okay? And he puts out these books. So he, he starts, he's writing them. He has people copying them. And then other people can get them. And now you have others that, you know, uh, other people can go to and say, well, what does it say about this? And he can look it up. He can use it as a reference. Okay? So it becomes wildly popular because he wrote a book instead of pamphlets. And so it's easy to find what he believes. Okay? So, um, so he puts out a few additions to the books in 1559. So he puts out a few additions, and in 1559, they are twice as long as the copy he had in 1536. So he keeps adding to it. Okay? So he gets a book in 1536, and then by 1559, it's a series of books. Okay? So um, he puts out the, the institutes and what, uh, what the Reformation, what the Reformers believe. So Calvin produces a book that has a collection of what Christians believe all in one place. Therefore, this is one of the reasons why Calvin gained popularity in his time and why he is still popular today. Um, he, because of his ability to get his message out, Calvin becomes popular. Um, uh, he does gain popularity based on what he believes, but it's, it's a lot of that people can look at it. So Calvin will go on to set up a social religious structure in Geneva, Switzerland, just across the border of France. So who was the Swiss reformer? Zwingli, but Zwingli dies. So Calvin will go on to have a strong impact on the French Reformation and the Swiss Reformation because he fills a void left by Zwingli's death. So because Zwingli uh, dies, Calvin, uh, who is a Frenchman, can, uh, he, he sets up camp in both areas because now there's a void in, in Geneva, in, in Switzerland. So this is another reason why Calvin is more popular. Many believe that Zwingli, had Zwingli not have died when he did, Calvin might not have been held as high regard as he is today. Zwingli had a movement going. He had a massive uh, military arm that was moving. Uh, he was able to, um, to take control and he was gaining popularity among the people, but he, uh, he bites off more than he can chew, basically. And so he loses in war. He dies. Now those people need a reformer. They need a leader. Calvin is setting up a French Reformation. He's put out books that, so that people have reference. And he can take over where Zwingli left off. And so he becomes... Uh, kind of this big reformer. Um, and, and, and so even today, we are dealing a lot with uh, what Calvin did, what the things that he said, the things that he wrote, um, even, even today. Um, I remember uh, it was... It was Right before, if you guys remember, um, I'm going to bring us into uh, Baptist side of things, okay? So if you guys remember maybe uh, 10 years ago, um, before all of the, you know, men and women's bathrooms things started and churches started to reform their constitutions, and do those things, uh, 
you know, before, right before that hit, that kind of put an end to this argument, this debate that was happening in Oklahoma Baptist. And if you guys rem- remember the messenger uh, that we put out, uh, that Oklahoma Baptist puts out, BGCO then, uh, but Oklahoma Baptist now, I remember there was a big a whole issue dedicated to this, what are we going to do with Calvinism? And uh, it was, I mean, it was every page, there was a massive article in the middle, and, and how do we as Baptists, because there was a, a massive surge of Calvinism in Southern Baptist churches. Um, when the, the, the bathrooms issue and all that stuff kind of took over, we kind of, that kind of hit the back burner. Okay, and so political climate kind of squashed that out, but it was happening. And they were talking about, are, are we as Southern Baptists going to have to split over this issue of Calvinism uh, versus, well, they, they would say versus Arminianism because people think there's only two camps in this argument, uh, but there's not. We'll get to, we'll get to that. But um, Calvin still has a massive influence on the church today and even denominations, okay? So if you have friends that are Presbyterians, they are Calvinistic because Calvin will start the Presbyterian church, okay? Um, Which is also in here in my slide somewhere, right here. Calvin is the originator of the Presbyterian church. So what he does then is he starts schools, he starts to educate, he starts... uh, uh, training of the presbyter. So the presbyter is an elder or minister of the Christian church. That's if you look up, that's the definition of presbyter. But that's why they're the Presbyterian church because they um, they he structures the church a little bit differently than the Catholic Church had. Okay, they had priests and popes and stuff. He has individual elders in charge of the churches who hold under an umbrella of belief that that today we would call Calvinism, but they didn't call it Calvinism then, okay? But there's an umbrella of belief, and he starts these churches that have an elder who is in charge of these individual churches, and um, they are the minister of that church, and he has a school that's going, So Calvin develops his church polity by adopting much of what Zwingli originated. So Zwingli was kind of starting that church polity thing and uh, reforming how the church was set up and how worship was set up. Uh, Calvin adopts a lot of Zwingli because he kind of just, as Zwingli dies, he he moves in um, as as the head reformer of of that, um, those followers of Zwingli become followers of Calvin uh, because he's, he's, he's now moved into the Swiss reform. He's doing a French reform. And uh, thanks to John Knox, uh, Presbyterianism will go to Scotland and eventually Ireland who have similar reformations. So because of what Calvin does, because of what he believes and what he institutes and what he puts together, he starts to send out these people and they go to other countries like Scotland and Ireland and they start those reformations there. And so the, um, what Luther started as a reformation starts to become a Presbyterian reformation um, of, of sorts, okay? But where people are questioning the Catholic Church. They're questioning uh, the things that's happening. And the biggest thing that they're doing is money is leaving. Okay, it's, I, I'd hate to tell you that the Reformation is about money. It wasn't. But a lot of the idea behind the people buying into this is he's starting a social reform. We can keep wealth here. We can support uh, our people here, instead of sit paying our money to the Catholic Church, who takes that money and goes builds elaborate uh, edifices in Rome, which is what they were doing. 
Okay? So, um, Presbyterianism uh, begins to move across Europe uh, because Calvin, uh, the things that he does, and he gains a wild popularity that is still with us today. So, uh, any questions on that? Um, getting you out a little bit early. Uh, so, um, if you have any questions, that, that's all I've got for us today. Um, we will get into uh, the theology of these guys, of, Calvin, of Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli uh, next week. So we're going to look at some of the things that they taught um, as opposed to uh, today, which was looking at the history of who they were and what they did. Okay, so you do have these snods and these different organizations, these different organizations, these different meetings that have pretty much set, but at this point in time in the scripture, um, what they're all using is a copy of the Vulgate. And so the Vulgate, um, usually having a, so, uh, John Calvin would have a French translation of the Latin Vulgate. Um, and so uh, that has the Apocrypha books in it. If, and it and, but it has all of the 66 books that we have today and all of and the Apocrypha books. And that's, that's what they're using. So when, when Wycliffe and Tyndale, they put out their Bibles... They usually included those um, if they got around to them. Because uh, remember, they have to translate it by hand and then put it out and copy it by hand. Um, so uh, if they get to them, then yeah, they have the Apocrypha books. But the Apocrypha books were, were kind of considered uh, more of lessons rather than well, this is the word of God, you know. Uh, some of the, they, they knew that these stories were written down later. Some of them did. Um, and, and so they, they weren't, the idea is different. See, we have the sola scriptura, the inerrancy of the word, because of what we have gone through. They haven't gone through that stuff. They just like, this is the scripture. These are what the people had. This is what Jerome put out. This is what we're using. Um, it won't be finished. The, the, the book that we have, the 66 books that we have, won't be finished and won't be set until 1611. We'll get to that, and it's not who you think did it, but uh, it, it's 1611 when that happens. We're, we're, we're super close. Yeah. We're, we're going we're gonna to stay on Luther and Calvin for a little bit, though. Mm-hmm. Are taking place, but they're, they're, it's more available as you get closer to 1611. Yes. You had the Bishop's Bible, you had the Great Bible, you had the chains of the pulpit. So, yeah, because we're, we're actually not really going to cover this a whole lot, but there's a lot happening in England. Um. Their Reformation is different than the rest of Europe. Their Reformation isn't so much a Protestant Reformation, but that um, the Anglican Church takes over as a twist of Catholicism because of Henry VIII wanting to divorce his wife. And so he, he, he separates the church in England, the Catholic Church in England, from the Roman church so that he can do some of the things that he wants to do and they declare him the leader of the church. Which is why Queen Elizabeth, when she passed away recently, there was a big thing like, well, who's going to lead the church? Because she was the leader of the church because of what Henry VIII did. 
Now, the Anglican Church has changed, pulled away from Catholicism, and looks more Protestant in, in many aspects, but it's, it, all it was was it was a Catholicism, we're pulling away, and we're still going to be Catholic. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, yeah. Hold on, let's, let's finish the class and then we'll go to that. So, uh, any other questions? All right, well, I'm going to pray and then we will be dismissed, except Jim's going to keep you here. God, we thank you for all that you do. We thank you uh, for the preservation of history, Lord, so that we can look and see where we come from. God, I pray that you will use this time, that we will use this time to focus on you and to look at maybe some of these issues and these, uh, these themes that we, we, may, we may take for granted, Lord, but that we will come back to them time and time again to establish where our hearts truly are, Lord. We thank you and we praise you for all that you do. Amen.